So um, I, I really do appreciate it. I know that everybody is busy. So obviously I am a female and I've been a, a female athlete. I still am. I'm an ultra runner. And so I'm still talking the talk and walking the walk. So I'm really excited about this. Um, we do have specialized and especially and doing intense training. There's just really some things to pay attention to. And I always say some habits to start early. I wish I would have started some of these habits earlier or even known what they were. So the science around um, females in sports in general has increased. Um, a lot of the science that we had around sports nutrition in the past had been male focused because that was, you know, really who's out there. And now at least we have some really good data um, that we can share. And I really do. I know there's a lot of you on this call. I'm going to try to be quick enough to allow enough space for questions. So I think because of the, the best thing to do here, so I'm going to go into presenting now. Many of you have heard these, uh, either myself, Jenna, or Maddie from A4 Health Speak, uh, but I'll show this slide anyway. So I'm the Christina part of this A4 Health group, which has been really grateful to be able to work with the Shattuck athletes over the last few years. Uh, I was pretty excited because I was talking to Joe about the fact that I do work for the San Jose Sharks hockey team and we just got the number one draft pick. So we're pretty excited about that. My counterpart, Jenna, is riding high with the Minnesota Timberwolves to just are steamrolling ahead. So it's pretty awesome to watch Permit Center, which works with some of the, the smaller uh, U.S. Olympic team hopefuls, whether it's juniors or um the adult level and everything in between. So that's a little bit about us, but let's talk about you guys now. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna talk about why it's even important to care about nutrition as a female athlete. All athletes in general though, this is what I say. I'm like, why would you practice and train so hard? and do everything that you're doing to actually support that performance. So it's not a missing link. I hear people say, well, nutrition's the missing link. No, it should be the solid link. Um, that and along with sleep hygiene. So if you get the sleep right, you get the nutrition right, the training and the performance um, should be through the roof. Because we know that you're already working hard on that. Uh, so what is to avoid low energy availability? and I'm probably going to beat that one more than you want to hear about it, but that's really a key focus uh, is to talk about what does low energy availability mean and how does it affect your performance? Uh, Nutrition is important in the fact that like having nutrient dense foods, not eating a bunch of garbage foods, isn't just about the inflammation that can come from it, but it's also about preventing deficiencies and vitamins and minerals play that key role in optimizing your performance and keeping you from getting injured and helping you recover. So you are growing and you are female athletes. So we're going to definitely talk about bone health and the importance of that and how to maintain that um, with uh, the rigor of your training schedule. And then obviously we're going to, we're female focused here, menstrual cycle, and we really are. So it's men's hormones fluctuate throughout the month, but there's a lot more um, specific nutrition issues that people have uh, that women have during um, menstruation that are specific and ways that you can adjust your nutrition to meet that. And then uh, how to reduce injury. And some of you might have been on that talk last week we talked about reducing injury risk. So let's start with energy. And I do like pictures so that if you guys go back and you want to look at the pictures, I've got them there. But when we think about fueling our body, what the heck are we fueling it for? How are we using energy or how we always talk about it, calories, our cells to grow and to repair themselves, to maintain our body temperature. And regulating that in the sport that you're playing is really important. Overheating or being hypothermic is not a great place for your body to be. So why do we take in energy? It's one of the reasons that we do it is to maintain our body temperature and an optimal internal body temperature is going to help you be a better performer. And then just our daily activities, right? Um, whether we're going to class, training, competition, 
our recovery, but taking in optimal energy or calories is vital for your immune system, your hormone regulation. And when I talk about hormone regulation and menstrual cycle, having that regulated actually helps your body perform at its best. So when we're dysregulated in our hormones, we are dysregulated in our performance. So there's some other key things that you guys can see there, but when we're under fueling, we're obviously, the, the recovery part also ends up being around our muscle repair. Um, male athletes will often talk about building muscle a lot, um, but we all need to build muscle, but we also all need to repair muscle. So an interesting thing over in this picture is talking about our energy availability. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but too low of calories has a significant effect, not just on your performance, but on your overall health. And we'll get into that a little more specific on this slide. So if we are taking in less calories than our body needs, what will the body prioritize? Well, it's still gonna wanna do cell growth and repair. It's gonna work really hard on that because it's how it keeps the body alive. It's gonna work hard on maintaining body temperature and just doing our daily activities. But what happens, what won't our body help us with if we have limited energy? Well, we're gonna end up with hormone dysfunction, so menstrual cycle irregular irregularities, poor recovery, and poor recovery can lead to increased risk for injury, uh, and then poor immune system. And all those nuggets together are things that I specifically work hard on with my professional athletes specifically. If they're not playing, they're not doing the thing that they're supposed to be doing, including their actual profession that they're getting paid for. So those three nuggets, poor recovery, increased risk of injury and poor immune system. Why should you take in the appropriate calories that make them nutrient dense? Those three are some, of, those are the biggest ones right there. But when we're also taking in amount of energy, uh, we're at increased risk for stress fractures. I know I've got all sports on here right now and every sport is at an increased risk for that, but soccer especially. So keeping our bones really strong and healthy for that sport and our joints and ligaments. Uh, but the other thing too, if we're low on energy, we have impaired judgment. And an athlete who isn't game aware isn't gonna be a great athlete either. So not making, not making smart decisions on the field, on the ice, in the pool, um, wherever you are at is going to impair your performance, right? So we're not just physical beings out there. We're also um, cognitive or thinking um, athletes as well. So a decreased training response. So we're always trying to build when we're doing strength and conditioning, dry land, whatever we're calling it. Uh, we're always trying to increase our training response and increase the amount of load and time and endurance that we have. So if you're not taking in enough calories, your body just isn't going to respond to increased training. And so you're not going to get to that higher level that you're looking for as well. And then this is huge, increased anxiety and depression. So it's a weird tie-in that we all have around keeping body composition where we need it to like this optimal level for our sport. Um, and sometimes that overtakes us into the fact that then we, we hedge too low on our energy intake, which can start a cycle of increased anxiety um, around that and then some mental health um, related issues as well. So having enough calories, having enough energy can really promote better, not only cognitive ju uh, judgment, but also um, mental health. So decreased coordination. So this also is, you know, impaired judgment, decreased coordination, um, a decrease in endurance as well. And I would say, probably want to play the whole game. You probably want to do the whole meet, you know, any of those things. You don't want to just be a, you know, a first half player. You need to have the energy um, to outlast the competitor. And we can see that a lot. I think we all know that when we're watching playoffs and things like that, the teams that are fueled properly are the ones that can make it into overtime and succeed in that. Uh, and it starts before you go into the locker room during uh, a break. Right. Uh, and then we've talked about hormone dysfunction, but then, um, a higher stress level ends up the body kind of goes into this uh, cortisol anxiety um, place when you're limiting calories. Because if you think about it, it's survival. It's a survival mechanism. And if your body thinks you're not going to feed it enough, it will start to kind of like shut down a little bit and get you, get you not in a good mental place. So there's a lot on this slide, but I really want you to take this in for a moment that when we talk about energy availability, we're really talking about the dietary energy available to maintain normal physiological function. 
So we're not talking about performance. We're just talking about your body performing at its best. And so there's a lot of science around how we figure that out. The amount of calories per kilogram per day your body needs to do that. But this is an important number down here. So if you don't know what your body weight is in kilograms, you basically, you take your body weight in pounds and you divide it by 2.2. And that's how you're going to figure out how many kilograms you are. And we do know that there's a threshold. We've got some really good science around this, that 30 calories per kilogram of your free fat mass is talking about your lean body mass, but per day. So anything that number and lower, you are going to have impaired performance. And um, so when we think about what's the minimum and when I work with athletes, we're trying to find that sweet spot. We don't want to get them down to their very, very minimum. Um, we want to buffer that a little bit. And especially if you're in a high training season, then we add activity factor and we add more calories to that. So this is very specific to females and it's really talking about the female athletic triad. So the impact of poor energy intake. Well, it basically leads to um, what we were just talking about, an energy deficiency that impairs bone health and menstrual dysfunction, and they kind of circulate around and they make each other worse. So, you know, which is it the chicken or the egg? Well, really, it starts with an energy deficiency. So an energy deficiency and that stress response that your body's going through will wreak havoc and it'll throw you into uh, menstrual dysfunction and impaired bone health and all of those things can lead to more injury as well. So what's the summary of talking about energy availability? This is one of my favorite lines that I tell all athletes, whether it's male or female, is underfueling equals underperforming. And there's no ribbons for that. Nobody's going to give you a medal for underfueling, um, but they are going to give you medals for performing at your best, right? So it's finding that sweet spot and it's not being afraid to test it out and to test out different foods and to train with that. But never forget, underfueling will always equal underperforming and there's no reward for that. All right, so we're gonna talk about nutrition and the menstrual cycle a little bit here. Uh, maybe some of you already know this, but what mineral is impacted the most by your menstrual cycle? Totally makes sense here if you think about it for a moment. Maybe some of you are more into the sciencey stuff than others and have it, but it's iron. So iron is a key component to life, but it's also a key component to um, oxygen transport and energy metabolism. Those two things are critical for all sport. We're always breathing. There is always some sort of aerobic level of activity in sport. And iron is the key mineral. It's the key component of hemoglobin, which helps with that oxygen transport and energy metabolism. So an iron deficient athlete and women are at far more risk for this because there is bleeding that happens monthly. And with that bleeding is a loss of iron. And if the diet is also low in iron, um, a female athlete can be really at high risk for iron deficiency. And so we do look at a few things. Um, we look at the storage form first. So if it's really low, so ferritin values, um, if they're lower than 40 nanograms per milliliter, that's um, that's when we start getting you know concerned and, and wanna help that athlete uh, increase their iron storage. And what are the causes of it? Well. One of the bullets that's not on here, there is a little bit of family genetics around it. So some, some family genetics will lead to more poor iron absorption. Um, but a vegetarian or vegan diet, we can talk about that. And I'm going to switch over to that where it says food sources of iron. So heme iron is the most bioavailable form of iron. And heme is actually Latin for blood. So um, the heme iron that you find in animal foods, but very specifically like red meat, not many of us are eating liver, I've got that, or oysters, but red meat or animal um, protein in general is higher in that highly absorbable iron. Now plants do have iron, it's in the non- form, which is less absorbable. 
but you can find it in fortified cereal, rich food will help with the absorption of that iron. So that's really key. So if you're choosing a vegetarian or vegan diet, there's some questions around that too. The right way is to get more iron into your diet. And you really are going to need more than somebody who might be eating a, a meat-based diet. So any sport that does a lot of foot striking, that can also affect um, iron levels because there's actually a little destruction that happens with foot strike things. So if you think about running, um, especially it would be one of those. Um, heavy menstrual cycles are going to put somebody at a high risk for iron deficiency. And then not eating enough again. So low energy availability. If you're not eating the foods, it's, it's really difficult to get that iron in there. So what happens if you have low iron, and especially if you're, you're deficient, insufficient or even anemic, which is kind of the more um, severe level there for endurance. So if you, you're not um, doing oxygen transport and you've got limitations to that, uh, so you, you are not going to have enough aerobic capacity um, to be optimal at your sport. Um, decreased energy availability for your reduced adaptations to training. And this really can, low iron can cause fatigue, dizziness, and or concentration. Um, also pale skin, but that doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't really affect your athletic performance, but that's one of the other things that's on there. Oops, make sure I didn't uh, miss anything. Did I go? Okay, here we go. So nutrition for the phases of the menstrual cycle. So right after you have your period is the follicular um, phase of so it's day one through 14. And in those, it's like really about replenishment. And so increased need for iron and vitamin um, C foods uh, because menstruation has occurred here and you need to like really um, bolster up your, um, your iron stores. And then there's an elevated use for carbohydrates during this. So fuel for intense training. So that's why that craving for carbohydrate might be in there. And then prioritize recovery nutrition basics. So um, protein intake, making sure you get nutrient dense, um, produce, so that's why we say antioxidants, so like fruits and vegetables, and hydration. So this might be um, the time where your body, again, needs more replenishment. Um, there's also some changes in your plasma volume too during this time because of the hormones related to menstruation. And so in the luteal phase, you really do want to honor your hunger cues. This is kind of where we talk about um, going towards PMS and um, you know ovulation and all of that. And there is elevated protein breakdown. So we do recommend a higher protein intake during this time up to 1.5 grams per kilogram. Could be even more, but that's the general guideline. Um, elevated use of dietary fat because um, the body is um, just cranking through some calories during this, this time of um, menstruation. So extra fuel for low intensity training. And we're going to talk about hydration. Um, hydration is always important, but um, again, plasma volumes are changing constantly with our hormones. So always keeping that top of mind. Since our muscles are mostly made out of water, always having hydrated muscles will always make you perform better. And then also I'd like to talk about B vitamins. So B vitamins are used for a variety of reasons, but B vitamins in the body sim, uh, support hormone regulation. They can help with PMS. So especially B6 um, vitamin can really help with symptoms around premenstrual syndrome and then energy metabolism too. So keeping your body's energy metabolism at, um, at prime level. So methylated forms. So you can look, um, Thorn is a great brand that I love and Thorn has um, their NFF approved for sport. So get used to using that anyway, for those of you who want to go on and play um, NCAA sports or Olympics any of those, that's really important. But Thorne has the great methylated B vitamins um, that I really recommend to a lot of my athletes. And then there can be changes in your GI function. So constipation, bloating, diarrhea, all of those things can happen during this time. And so as I've always said, digestion shouldn't hurt. And when you are kind of crossing over from PMS into menstruation, um, this you know, being really mindful of your diet and trying to recognize foods that help your digestion work the best, um, either not constipating, bloating, or also foods that might be the other way and be offending and causing diarrhea. So 
hormones do play a big role in this. And then being really mindful of the foods that make your stomach feel great and foods that don't and really kind of monitoring your diet and adjusting as needed. We talked a lot about hydration in all the talks, but again, because it's super important, it impacts your thermoregulation. So your fluid balance, your sweat rate may increase during your luteal phase compared to your follicular phase. But again, I don't get too worked up about you know, should I have more water during this time of my month or not? Just drink water. Make sure that you're making a solid effort to support your hydration, um, regardless of your cycle. And when sweat loss increases, because sometimes when our hormones change during the month, we sweat more. So you need to prioritize more electrolytes to replace what is lost. And what's specifically lost, some amount of electrolytes always lost, but sodium is the primary electrolyte that we uh, lose. So don't be afraid to drink uh, electrolyte uh, products, but also don't be afraid to have salt on your food. So bone health. Uh, bone health is important for any athlete, but women in particular. Um, why? Because we uh, develop our bones and kind of stop accumulating um, bone structure earlier than men. So it's really important that we focus on our bone health early because we stop building sort of that main structure of our bone in our early 20s. So it's really important to care about our bone mineral density. Um, and it really, having that as a predictor of the integrity and the strength, right? We really wanna go in with the strongest foundation because poor bone density obviously is going to put you at higher risk for injury. So during your menstrual cycle, um, shifts in your hormones happen. And when low energy availability happens, we end up making different choices with our food. So um, poor regulation of hormones, loss of period, further impacts the ability to maintain bone um, integrity. So in that female triad, if you lose menstruation um, because of having a decrease in energy availability that can really wreak havoc on your bone health as well. So um, stopping having a period will affect bone health. Um, what can we do about it? Um, well, I just say eat a nutrient dense diet in general. If you don't love calcium rich foods like dairy, and I would say that the research is kind of all over the place and whether you specifically need to eat dairy foods to get calcium. I don't necessarily, yes, it's a good source of it, but I don't necessarily say that that's the only place you need to go. And also if you are lactose intolerant or dairy doesn't make you feel good, then don't eat it. That's also what we don't want you to do is have digestive health issues because you're trying to chug down dairy products. So you can look for fortified plant-based milks that have calcium added to it. Leafy greens, do have calcium in it and they're not absorbed super well. So when people are like, oh, I can get it from like spinach or broccoli. I'm like, you can, but it doesn't absorb very well. Um, so this might be an instance where you want to think about taking a calcium supplement um, and its best friend is vitamin D. So they need to go together because it's essential for calcium absorption. Vitamin D is amazing for a lot of reasons, immune function, mental health. Um, it's part of like many metabolic processes. So indoor athletes are just living in Minnesota in general, just never getting enough vitamin D from the sun. Now in the summer, if you're outside at least 15 to 30 minutes a day, then maybe, but we definitely do recommend that female athletes focus on vitamin D and you wanna do vitamin D3. So that's the form you want. Um, you know, 2000 to 5,000 is a pretty high level, but I, I think, especially when you're doing your sport, um, you know, definitely at least one to 2000. And if you're spotty at taking your vitamin D, then you definitely could take 5,000 international units a few times a week. If you don't remember to take them every day, um, you can get it from fortified and other fortified foods as well. Um, but this is one that I just highly recommend for all athletes, but especially female athletes. Okay. There's so much more we could talk about, but I wanted to make sure that I kept some space for answering questions because um, I hope that there's a lot. I see one in the chat right now. Um, I just see iron, so it's not a question. But does anybody have any questions for me? And this can be things that we didn't even obviously talk about today um, specific to female athletes. 
And you can unmute yourself too. That's fine if you want to audio ask. Yeah. I want to know what GI is. Gastrointestinal. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Good to ask if you don't know. So when we're talking about GI health, we're talking about like your gut health. So your stomach, your intestines, all